And good morning, your Royal Highnesses and uh, dear planetary guardians for a transformation to sustainable and healthy diets in the world. Science has welcomed humanity to the Anthropocene. We're now in a new geological epoch. We're hitting the ceiling of the planetary capacity to support humanity. We're in a turbulent world where we need nothing less than a transformation towards a sustainable future. And as we say in Sweden, Poletten har börjat trilla ner. The scientific insights are actually coming into place. Last year, humanity, 196 countries, agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals, which is nothing less than a tremendous opportunity and a huge obligation for humanity. But these are six, 17 goals often thought of quite linearly, and Pavel and I have sat down and realized we have to restructure them. So today, at the EAT Forum, we're rethinking the entire structure of our transformation into the future. And this is how it looks like. What we need to recognize is that, yes, we have aspirational goals to end hunger, end poverty, gender equity, economic growth, all of these social goals which we have agreed on. We have economic methods to achieve them, but they need to occur within the safe operating space of a stable and resilient planet. We think that we now need to truly transition into a safe operating space and achieve that in prosperity for healthy and sustainable diets. That's right. And the biosphere that you have shown out here needs resilience. And the society that you have shown above it in this wedding cake uh, needs, <laughs> needs to have equity. Because without that, you can't really have sustainability. And finally, the economy needs efficiency. So actually, this wedding cake, this layered approach of goals stacked one upon the other integrates really well. And I do remember the afternoon not far from here in Stockholm Archipelago when we worked on this uh, before the SDGs. And we delivered it to Ban Ki-moon, and unfortunately it wasn't taken in full, but uh, this is our chance perhaps to transition into this new paradigm of reconnecting to the biosphere as a pathway for sustainable and healthy diets Absolutely. into the future. And the big question, of course, as Gunnar already pointed out, what role does food yeah. play in this transition? Mm. And just to lay this out for you in a few scientific details, that of course we have agreed in New York in General Assembly to eradicate hunger, to transition into healthy food for all, and that this links very closely to our ocean goal. That, in fact, there is no food security in the future without recognizing that we have an exponential hockey stick of overexploitation in the oceans. You may have seen the latest science where we may even be facing up to 90% overfishing in the oceans, undermining the SDG on food. Mm. We have an unprecedented El Nino event accentuated by anthropogenic climate change, which has led to a shock scientifically of even hitting the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, which was something we had never seen before and thought was not a risk we were facing. But at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming, we're actually at that juncture, that we risk undermining the livelihoods for 250 million people and the food source of protein for over 1 billion, depending to at least 20% on fish protein. Yeah. And we're undermining our oceans with this extraordinary other hockey stick pattern of risking to have more volume of plastic in the ocean by 2050 than we have volume of fish in the ocean. Mm. And on top of this, climate change is leading to ocean acidification at a pace that risks actually knocking over through different you know, rapid bleaching events, the coral reef systems in the world. And we know that the reason why this is occurring is actually the Earth resilience, the ability of nature to actually take up carbon dioxide. So we have an enormous link between food and the ocean goal. And it's really no better on land, because here on land we have destroyed forests, consumed wetlands right here in Europe. Almost 67, 60 to 70% are gone over the last two centuries. And if you look at the way land is being used today, Almost 26% of land on Earth, greater than the continent of Africa, is in some form or the other a cattle ranch or grazing commons. About 13% is growing food, staples for us. Another 3% is growing feedstock for livestock. So we really have to think about this 40% of land that we have basically captured for our consumption in the context of what does the rest of the world need in terms of its species and its life. And we have to recognize that it's not just 40, but we are moving towards 70% of land use if we do business as usual. If we change, make no change in our model of agriculture, then that's what we will end up. That's quite a horrendous task. That's quite a horrendous thought. And with it comes the specter of what will happen to the water that we need to get there. And as we all know, fresh water 
Food is the world's largest single consumer of fresh water. In fact, 70% of our withdrawals from rivers is from oceans and rivers, uh, rivers, of course, the freshwater side. And we know that the future for food is really about productivity increases in rainforest agriculture to be able at all to feed a world of 9, 10 billion people and meet this tremendous challenge. The climate side of this coin is closely linked as food, as you all know. Agriculture is the world's single largest emitter of greenhouse gases. We know that we have win-win solutions on meat where we actually can reduce health impacts but also reduce emission of greenhouse gases in a very tremendous way, which would then link to the health goal yep. because we now know that we have almost equal numbers of obese in many parts of the world and overweight as we have malnourished people. Right. So how we turn this around, we link food with both the safe operating space on biosphere and the different health goals. That takes us to the poverty side of the coin, which of course is undermined by the food mm. agenda entirely. And this is no new statistic for you, just the fact that we have you know, 1.9 billion overweight, but 1 billion still starving. We have over 2 billion people undernourished, leading to stunting across the world. This is a prerequisite to have any chance of a transition to attain yeah. the sustainable development yeah. goals, yeah. of having food for health, but food for a poverty alleviation goal in the SDGs. That's right. And if we look at poverty and where food is grown, remember Africa. In fact, Africa grows a lot of food. Most of it is grown by women. And the question is, how will we achieve this SDG of gender equity if we are not going to focus on the lives of the women in Africa who are actually most of the farmers? How, for that matter, will we actually solve the problem of demand for labor and the 1.3 billion jobs that agriculture provides, of which a billion are in small farms less than two hectares, unless we can have a better, more productive, less risky small farm. How, for that matter, will we provide decent work and economic growth, goal number eight, if we don't focus on the billion point three jobs that agriculture provides, and how, Will we reduce inequalities if we do not attend to the livelihoods, the pricing of food grown in these small farms? Frankly, all of the goals, in some way or the other, all of the SDGs are connected with food. Something we have to think about is a new lens for looking at food, because too much we have focused on just per hectare productivity as the way forward. And the problem with doing that is, of course, we forget that food is about a billion jobs, it's about nutrition, it's about health, it's about culture, it's about all of these things. And yet, when we come to measuring food, we just look at per hectare productivity. We need a much more comprehensive lens, a lens that shows that we are actually flying a spaceship rather than navigating a ship with a mariner's compass. That kind of lens. And the question then arises, and it will be asked, well, isn't it too difficult to calculate all these impacts? Can you, for instance, calculate the impact of agrochemical compounds on human health? Well, the surprising good answer is yes, you can. It's already been done for endocrine disruptors. This was work done for the European Union, 150, 150 odd billion dollars worth of costs. Others will ask you, Fine, even if you know these costs and these answers, why would a poor country ever worry about this? Because all they want is cheap food. All they want is the price to be low. But the reality is, that's not true. We have Sri Lanka, which already has a three-year plan for a toxin-free Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, in response to the World Health Organization warning on glyphosates, has already banned glyphosates, and that's a developing country. And then, Others will ask you, quite fairly, okay, fine, we accept that this is possible to calculate through a new lens and it's maybe going to be responded to by developing countries, but why would investors worry about this? Why would investors worry about sustainability? But the interesting thing is, even here, we have a surprising answer for you that yes, investors do worry. In fact, almost a tenth of the total debt and equity assets in the world, $215 trillion, 21.3 trillion of those are being examined through the lens of sustainability today. And in fact, this is an increase of almost 30% per year over the last two years. So yes, investors are taking serious note. They are looking at companies and their value chains. And what would companies do, Johan, and with so, their value chains? So the big challenge here is that we all know that we need a transformation towards a sustainable future, that food plays a central role to achieve this 
uh, tremendous challenge, but it also has to occur at a rapid, rapid pace. We only have basically one generation to make this transition to a fossil fuel-free, sustainable future in the world. And the big question then is, is it possible to leverage, yeah. as you pointed out, the 10% that today already invest in sustainability to get the other 90% to move? And we've been exploring this by, for example, looking at the seafood industry. And what we find is that in the thousands of actors you see on the x-axis here, yeah. there are 13 outliers that actually represent up to 40% of the economy in the seafood industry that fish across the entire ocean spectrum on the planet, that are drivers of aquaculture and policy influence, and that these 13 is what we today call keystone actors. And the big question, of course, is what if we would be able to transition into a logic of having a transformation towards prosperity, towards revenue and profit within a safe operating space in this wedding cake structure of the SDGs, to be able to get these companies to show that, yes, we can. Yes, it makes sense to have sustainability as the entry point for a secure revenue pathway and cut us off from this uh, prisoner's dilemma that large parts of the actors are today. That, you know, if I'm sustainable on my little ocean, mm. others will fish that ocean mm. the day after. Right. And this has led to one mm. option for this uh, David and Goliath type strategy, mm. where in fact alliances for success today in the world, even if they only represent 10% yeah. as the finances is today, mm. could actually tip over the remaining 90%. Mm. And that is what we're hoping that this EAT forum could actually be inspired by, that science says that let's Let's put the wedding cake of the SDGs into the plate. Let's think of a paradigm shift of truly seeing our planet as a non-negotiable, but not as a limitation for prosperity, transformation and success, and that in fact food is a prerequisite for that success. As Gunnar pointed out, if we can really succeed on food, we'll succeed for people and we'll succeed for planet. And there's clearly a partnership between science, business and policy in such a transition. So we're looking forward to some uh, really constructive days That's together. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We did it on time. <laughs>